It's good to be here. It's good to be with you too. I'm going to start by asking this question, Becca. Um, when, from whom, or in what experience did you first feel those persistent nudges toward peacemaking? Mm -hmm. Well, I first experienced those when I was possibly in late middle school or early high school, which is around the time that my family joined a Church of the Brethren congregation. Before then, we were American Baptist and had no real discussion about peace or social justice, um, or at least not much of one. And so being confronted with this entirely different way of approaching faith uh, really made me think about what peace looked like and who works for peace. And I was really curious about these people that I was meeting who were really engaged in this type of work. And the first time I realized that this might be something that I was interested in doing, um, probably be around my senior year of high school when I realized I very much wanted to do Brethren Volunteer Service to the point where I was willing to do it before college um, and had to convince my parents that that was a good idea. So I had to think critically around why I was interested in doing that. And, um, and so did you make some of those connections in BVS? I did make some of those connections, although many of them I'd made before in the context of youth group or in uh -huh. context of other discussions. Um, my site was focused more on what I would call justice work rather than um, actively being engaged in dismantling um, agents of violence or conflict work specifically. So, so what was your project? I worked at Gould Farm in Monterey, Massachusetts with adults experiencing mental illness and um, helping them on a road to recovery. Interesting. So. Okay, great. Wow. Well, Cliff, I'm curious about how you differentiate between justice and peace and what words you use to describe what it is that you do. I probably often use those synonymously because I think injustice is often mm -hmm. one of the main causes of violence and so to build justice is to build peace so for me it often goes together um, I might talk about human rights and some of the work that I do human rights is a pretty important issue or my justice comments might deal with economic issues um, more recently, I think it's become clear the issues of racism and sexism are part of often injustices or are seedbeds for violence. And so to build peace means to work at those issues and try to bring fairness, equality mm -hmm. to a situation. Um, but justice and peace, I probably often talk about downward mobility too, mm -hmm. because I think that's a, maybe it's the, my sense that it's gonna require that for us to really work at peacemaking or justice making. What do you mean by downward mobility? For me, it means an intentional decision, especially for us in the first world, to reduce our consumption level or our income level for Arlene and me, it's been important. Since we were married, we made a decision to keep our income below the taxable level. And so it, it forced us not to be high consumers, mm -hmm. but also gave us the time to be volunteers working in peace and justice issues. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. How did you, I mean, you say that when you were married, you made this decision. So what led you to make that decision? What were the influences that brought you to that point? I think at first it was the tax issue. We wanted, we decided we didn't want to pay taxes for war mm -hmm. because taxes for war meant that we were contributing to war even though we were opposed to war. Right. So we said, okay, well, how do we do that? And we decided the easiest way to do that was to keep our income below the taxable level. And that would also work at the issue of not having a lifestyle that needed to be defended by war. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the way we started grappling with that issue of downward mobility. And we, we still are among the super rich of the world, so mm -hmm. what does that mean, downwardly mobile? Right. Yeah. What are the words you use to speak about peace and justice, then, Becca? 
-hmm. Well, I use peace and justice, um, and I, I really liked what you were saying about how interconnected they are and how you can't really have peace without justice. Um, but I still, at least internally, use them as um, peace being the absence of conflict and the presence of justice. And so justice is the oh, institutions or the way that the world is organized okay. that cares for each person equally or makes sure that each person has a chance. Um, so I, I do distinguish between mm -hmm. the two, but I completely agree that they're both absolutely necessary. Um, yeah, and then a lot of the words you would talk about, human rights, mm -hmm. it's really important. Um, and expanding that human rights to include, uh, we were mentioning um, economics and sexism and racism and using human rights as a frame for that too, that people have the human right to have enough to make sure that they've got food, to make sure they're being treated equally. Um, so sort of talking about that other than just this UN list of human rights. Yeah. But how, do you, how do you view that in our world today where we seem to be moving further apart as rich and poor? Mm -hmm. I was, when we were thinking through some of the questions we might ask one another, that was something that really stood out clearly to me because right now I'm working primarily with a lot of students of peace studies at Manchester oh. University. And I hear a lot of them talking about um, economic inequality in the country and worldwide and their own place within that system of being part of the system with student debt in particular. Mm -hmm. And hearing some of them anguish around how are they going to be able to work for justice and peace in the way they want, knowing they have student debt. and despairing over their economic position within our system here in the U.S. while recognizing that we're still vastly more wealthy yeah. than the majority of people around the world. And that mm -hmm. struggle is really, I think, very important to grapple with and to, I feel like I'm only just starting to understand my place within that. Um, yeah. But wow. it's something that gets me really excited to talk You're about. You're way ahead of me then. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. But yeah, it feels really powerful. Yeah. It feels like that yeah. is at play in every conflict yeah. in various ways. Um, although how to fix that feels huge. So. Can I move in a different direction? Maybe, mm -hmm. mm, maybe more a sense level. If, if you think about peace, what are the sounds or smells or sights of peace for you? What? It's a good question. It's kind of a hard one. <laughs> well, I don't even know if it has answers. But sure. I, I, I tend to think of... Um, maybe a community coming together around a meal. Mm -hmm. um, and so the smell of the food and the sound of laughter and kids running underfoot and conversation happening. Um, and an explanation for that, although I'm sure you can take of that what you will, the presence of food, the presence of um, what it takes to be able to come together as opposed to violence or um, instability that would take people apart mm -hmm. from one another. Um, I don't know. I think it would look very different in lots of different places. What, yeah. what would you think of for yourself? Well, as you talk about that, mm -hmm. it seems like trust is essential. Mm -hmm. So what does trust look like? And maybe a meal is a good picture. I like that. But it, it might also be just being together, whether it's on mm -hmm. a walk or sitting comfortably on a, on a bus or... Mm -hmm. Um, in a, hmm. maybe it has to do though too with the environment, the ecology around us. Because I think peace, we haven't talked about that yet, but somehow I think there's that there. So it's where the biblical images of the lion mm -hmm. laying down with the lamb, that's an image mm -hmm. that I think t speaks toward peace or justice or or goodness, goodness, mm -hmm. maybe it's goodness, uh, where you can 
walk next to the snake and you don't have to worry about it. You mm -hmm. aren't, aren't, you're at peace, you're at calm with the things around you. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we take advantage of our environment, we're not, we probably don't feel comfortable with it. We feel like if we're, we know we're taking advantage of it, so right. we, we're kind of un uneasy. So being at ease is a feeling, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can answer my own sure. question. <laughs> well, I'm curious, this uh, idea of the ecology of what's around us, and I know you've been in various different conflict zones, and I'm wondering what have you seen in terms of how people reclaim their space, or uh, the way you were phrasing it earlier was taking the initiative away from the agents of violence. How do people make that space for themselves? Well, one place that comes to mind when you ask that question is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mm -hmm. And I was just there in December, about three, four months ago. And the Congo is one of the worst places of violence we've seen since the Second World War. It has a lot to do with the injustice of resources, the, the people who live there, don't benefit from the resources that mm -hmm. get ripped off from their country. But I see it on the roads. The roads are wretched. I've never ridden on roads like that. I mean, whether we were in a four-wheel drive vehicle, on a bus, or on a, a moto, a small motorbike, you were all over the road mm -hmm. trying to miss the potholes, the big lakes that were part of the mm -hmm. road, or the washouts, or places where it caved into the, the side ditches. And those were symbols of a society that's just been abandoned, or the infrastructure has been abandoned. And the same thing with the schools, with houses. But in the midst of that, then I would see people caring for each other, mm -hmm. paying attention to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, being concerned about each other. And that, for me, is sort of like, okay, that's where the hope is, mm -hmm. when p people start to build those relationships. And for me, the most powerful experience of that, retaking the initiative from the actors of violence, mm -hmm. I think that's an important phrase, is when I was there in the Congo earlier, and I saw two examples. One was a pastor who got involved in the political process to bring armed actors together to work toward mm -hmm. uh, a signed treaty, mm -hmm. who tried to put the, a new alternative government in place. That was retaking the initiative, not mm -hmm. conceding that space to those who controlled every single aspect of society. Mm -hmm. Or a woman, just Masika, who blows me away. She and her daughters had been raped by rebel fighters who mm -hmm. came into their village. And she was left for dead, mm -hmm. and she probably would have died. But somebody from Synergie des Femmes found her. Doctors put her back together mm -hmm. physically. Synergie found a safe place for her, offered psychological counseling, which she needed. And she went back and crossed those front lines regularly oh. convinced that no more were the actors of violence going to determine the future. Her grandchildren, she had the big, mm -hmm. her daughters had grandchildren from the rapes, mm -hmm. were going to grow up in a different world, mm -hmm. and she was willing to take, do whatever it took wow. to do that. And so for me, it's that kind of example. It says, so I ask, well, I can't do it like that, but what can I do mm -hmm. to retake the initiative from armed actors? And mm -hmm. I think there are always places, ways to do that, but that's a long answer wow. to your question. But. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you are working at peacemaking, what are the tools or what is the mental framework that puts you in the best space to do that peacemaking? Mm -hmm. I think that depends on what type of peacemaking okay. you're working on. Um, my experiences have largely been within the U.S. and around 
um, various issues specifically on our campus. Um, the peacemaking I did during VVS was a lot about um, caring for someone mm -hmm. who doesn't often feel care. And so in that instance, uh, being really intentional about being patient or about being whole myself was incredibly important. So I had to find ways of keeping balance. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm on campus working with students or when I was a student, uh, I think keeping creativity alive is really important yeah. um, because it's very easy to see the way things have been and the way they continue to be and get stuck in that and not be able to think outside the box or think of uh, what might be new ways of being, first of all, what is even possible, second of all, and how you bridge the two. Um, I like that emphasis on creativity. I yeah, think that's so true. I think it can't be done without creativity yeah. um, and imagination, yeah. being able to think of yeah. how do we disrupt the system. Yeah. Because it's, it's easy for us just to get stuck in ruts of the way things have been done. Oh, absolutely. Patterns that maintain injustice or violence. Mm -hmm. And so, and it takes, I mean, it, it takes more than just imagination or or creativity, it takes some risk taking too, mm -hmm. doesn't it? I think it absolutely, and it takes sort of this element of the constructive program, huh. not just being an, a naysayer or saying, oh, we shouldn't do that anymore, but having something to offer up. Say more about that. Uh, well, without some alternative, um, a constructive program, something that could be put in place instead of whatever the system is currently, how mm -hmm. can we devise a plan to get to what it is we're going towards if we don't yeah. even know what that is? Um, so it could be any small thing, like a change on campus, to how do we dismantle the military-industrial complex if we don't have something that fulfills the roles it's playing yeah. in our society right now to work towards getting to. So have you found that that you can do that alone? Oh. Or no. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> what have you found? I, yeah, community is essential. Yeah. For me, it's always helpful to have other people. Mm -hmm. When I went to do the training in the Congo, it was last mm -hmm. December, I was by myself and I really oh, felt wow. weak, mm -hmm. like I was all alone. Like I, I didn't have the people to bounce it off. So I just used the 24 people who were part of the training and they became my, my team mm -hmm. because you're so much weaker as an individual. You're, you're vulnerable. If, if threats start to come your way, mm -hmm. it's much easier to manip be manipulated by those outside forces. And, but if you have somebody say, hey, this is what's happening, what am I, mm -hmm. how am I gonna respond to mm -hmm. it? Then you can respond to mm -hmm. it. And I think we sp respond out of strength. So. Right, and I think that's important for creative thinking and risk taking too. I mean, it's really hard to have all the responsibility for coming up with a creative solution on your own. And same with risk taking. I, it's yeah. almost more than risk when you're just doing it yourself as opposed to with a group supporting you. So, so maybe it's not going to be some genius like Einstein sitting <laughs> over, over in a corner who's going to solve all our problems as a society or a world. Right. It's going to be a team of people or a team of people that incorporate the rest of the world absolutely that begin to answer the problem mm -hmm. yeah i'm wondering along with this risk and along with being in a team what are some of the most difficult situations you've faced and how do you find mm -hmm. solutions in the midst of your peacemaking peace building may i use an example please uh -oh. Maybe one of the more difficult places I was was in Baghdad when Shaq and Oh was getting ready to come out of the sky. And it's interesting because we were there five months and when we first went, we assumed that the war would start almost immediately. And it almost became a situation where as long as we were convinced the war couldn't happen, it couldn't happen. Hmm. It was like a state of mind, and maybe like, for me, it's, it parallels Jesus' state of mind. When he came into Jerusalem on a donkey, he said, the reign of God is at hand. 
And they said, oh, come off. What kind of wild guy are you? Everybody can see that Roman mm. Empire is in charge. Mm. And he said, no, no, really, it's not true. Mm. The reign of God, of justice, of peace is here at hand. And then he started to do things like people got fed and people got healed and injustices started to change. He started working with women. Mm -hmm. They became the model people. It's like people started to say, oh, maybe he's right. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the same way, it's like it happened like that mm -hmm. in Baghdad until the point at which we conceded. I think it, it did happen. We conceded that space mm -hmm. and shock and awe happened. So, so we have to maintain our confidence mm -hmm. and be building the new society right there in the midst. And we were. We were meeting with people, mm -hmm. Iraqis, all over, all over the country. Mm -hmm. And it was clear. I mean, there wasn't any threat from Iraqis. I could walk on, in the streets of Baghdad and then after midnight by myself. And I wasn't, there wasn't any threat to me. Mm -hmm. So what is this threat? Iraq is supposed to have toward the United States. So we have to live that reality, be convinced of it. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if it makes sense, but sure. it, was, it felt powerful there. What do you mean by conceding that space? It's like we gave up our confidence. Mm -hmm. We said, oh, well, maybe it will happen. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, it did happen. If everybody mm -hmm. read the news, you know that Shock yeah. and awe came out of the sky, and Iraq was destroyed mm -hmm. as a people and as a as a culture, and and the United States at the same time was destroyed as mm -hmm. a people and as a culture. So it didn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was clear we probably represented the majority of the world's people in saying it, it shouldn't happen, mm -hmm. but we weren't. But I think we learned in that process that we do have the tools to change those situations. So right. another example was like Vieques, Puerto Rico. It was clear that we, the U.S. Navy was the most powerful force the world had ever seen. And yet a little handful of fisher folk, teachers, mm -hmm. peace people, veterans, mm -hmm. youth, religious people, came together and the U.S. Navy left the AKs in all of Puerto Rico. And it, you know that it can't happen like that. Mm -hmm. But it did happen like yeah. that. So it's, it's that taking the initiative, cre mm -hmm. being creative about how to respond, starting to set up the future mm -hmm. right here in the midst of, of the old. <sighs> <laughs> yeah. And where do you find, so you're mentioning one or two successes. What are the successes you see and how do you keep going in the face of struggles or defeats? Well, once you have one victory, uh -huh. then you can say, oh, it could happen again. And I think one of the things that undergirds me is the whole image of resurrection in mm -hmm. the Christian tradition, that life is more powerful. Life is stronger than death. It doesn't come as, as a framework of strength. It comes almost as a framework of weakness. Jesus is on a donkey coming into Jerusalem. But lo and behold, it's more powerful than the mightiest force then, the Roman mm -hmm. Empire, or the mightiest force now, the US Navy. And so, yeah, I get there are times mm -hmm. I get discouraged, but then I say, come on, Cliff, you know, you know where the truth is. Mm -hmm. Why do you get discouraged? Find mm -hmm. somebody else who's not discouraged. Rub shoulders with them mm -hmm. and step out again. Yeah. <laughs> so. hmm. How about you? If you? How do you get out of places where you feel like things can't work out? Mm -hmm. Or that you're facing a brick wall and it's not going to crumble? Right. What, what do you do then? One example for me and what has been happening over the past few years, I've really been um, sort of consumed with this idea of gender-based violence mm -hmm. and how that plays out in our communities. And last April on campus, there was a big movement against 
what we call rape culture on mm -hmm. campus. Um, and I realized that more women um, who I know have experienced assault or harassment or felt threatened than women who hadn't. And I felt completely overwhelmed. Um, and then and then there was a spark and people came together and people organized. And I think it's that community and being with other people who hold the same vision and who are working towards the same future that you want to see and being able to draw on that energy was amazing. We got more accomplished in the week of working together than we had in three or four years on yeah. campus, it felt like. And that work continues even to literally today yeah. where the campus is still talking about how do we keep our people safe and how do we take that to our communities as well. And that yeah. is amazing to see what people can do when they're all pulling in the same direction and when they're using each other's energy to get there. It's pretty remarkable. Hang on to that because mm -hmm. I think that issue is is probably one of the most important ones globally too, mm -hmm. not just here in North right. Manchester, absolutely, but across our society, mm -hmm. across countries all around the world, mm -hmm. in war zones, right? And it's people like me, males, mm -hmm. who have to do the changing. And how do you know? How do you get us to the place where we can change? Right. And how do we, as women, reclaim our status as survivors and as um, agents of change and not yeah. giving up that power yeah. that was taken from us in various ways um, yeah. and doing it with other people who are organizing with you mm -hmm. that's amazing that aspect of community is so important mm -hmm. but it's hard sometimes it's hard to build community mm -hmm. where there's lots of mistrust where mm -hmm. there's lots of fear fear that's yeah. an important one what how do you deal with fear? Mm -hmm. How do we deal with fear? Right. What, as people trying to build peace, how do we deal with fear? Right. I, in my experience, the only way I've been able to deal with it is by finding at least one other person that I can share my fear with, uh -huh. to be able to acknowledge openly that I have fear. Um, and let that speak for itself and open that up for the other person to also share they have fear and realize there's two and not one. But I'm curious about how you've dealt with that. In, I mean, I would say that I probably have never had my life in danger around any of the peacemaking I've done. Um, how do you deal with it when your life is literally on the line sometimes? I don't know if this is quite an answer, Becca. So if it mm -hmm. isn't, come back to me. Okay. I mean, the way, way it has worked, I'll, I'll say it this way, there have, been, there have been a handful of times, like four or five times when I thought, okay, tonight, I guess I die. Like when the suicide bomber mm -hmm. came to our house, when we were waiting for shock and awe, one of my teammates said we had a, a very little chance of coming out of it alive. Mm -hmm. And other times when I had an automatic weapon at my chest, or when Israeli soldiers raided the house I was in mm -hmm. one night. And I think I've come to the place that I have died. In, in one sense, I have died. And from now on, everything else is bonus. So I, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, come on, Claire. <laughs> what do you have mm -hmm. to worry about? You're already a dead man four times over. So, mm -hmm. so give it everything you've got. And, uh -huh paying the consequences. And how did you get to that point? Well, I think that one time mm -hmm. I was in a car accident. We were coming out of Iraq during the war. Mm -hmm. We had been ordered out by Iraqi security and we had a car accident. And five of us in the car were injured and I was on, they were sewing my head. I split my head wow. open. And they were sewing my head back together. Mm -hmm. And during that incident, I had a moment when I was away from, I was up here, mm -hmm. I was looking down at that. Mm -hmm. It's like God was asking, okay, Cliff, are you ready to die? You want to stay around for a while? It, was, it would have been easy to die. I wasn't in right. pain. I lived a very full life, so mm -hmm. I was like, it was a good question. Mm -hmm. And I decided, well, maybe it's okay. I'd like to hang around for a while. And then I was back in my body and 
looks like. Okay. And that was probably the most realistic mm -hmm. place I've been where I've grappled with that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> so does that mean you don't feel fear? Or how do you handle fear when you do experience it? I think I probably do have fear, but it's a different way of working with it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just fear, Cliff. <laughs> Don't <laughs> worry about fear. That's okay. And mm -hmm. so I'm back where I started. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's an answer. I don't know. I think you're, what you talked about, sharing with other people mm -hmm. is key and building a community. Mm -hmm. and, and often when I go into a place to build connections with the local actors of peace, mm -hmm. that's important because they understand it. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the ones who are going to do more of the mm -hmm. real work of peace building. So to build those alliances, right. I think often fear is uncertainty. And when, the more pieces we can get in place that we understand or that fit together, mm -hmm. then the less uncertainty and so diminishes fear. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I wonder too about another kind of fear entirely. I mean, there's this sense of doing the work of peace and having threats coming in, et cetera. But there's also this element of fear around like going all the way back to the beginning, downward mobility, this fear of giving up uh -huh. what we do have to face the unknown entirely. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on, I mean, how, d so you made the decision to live so that you wouldn't be taxed. Yeah. Was there fear with that? Or how did you there was a lot explain of uncertainty. that to people? You know, mm -hmm. people would say, well, you can't raise a family, or you couldn't go to school, or mm -hmm. you couldn't buy land, or you couldn't. Right. But I knew people who, who had done those things, mm -hmm. who were, and in fact, most of the world's people mm -hmm. already <laughs> under the taxable level, and they survived. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe a, a, a piece of it is to not say, oh, for the next hundred years, we're going to live below the tax, but make it, why don't we try it as an experiment for a while? Mm -hmm. without that long-term commitment. And, mm -hmm. and then, huh, that worked. How about if we extend it? Mm -hmm. Or another way of thinking of it is to try role plays. I remember once we got visited by the suicide bomber, you start laying awake at night, you hear a creak in the hallway, you say, okay, okay, so, okay, it could be a suicide. Okay, if a suicide bomber comes into my room, how am I going to react? Mm -hmm. say, okay, what time do you have? Or how about something to eat? Or, mm -hmm. And you start thinking those things out. And then you have some options. And then, OK, well, I hope he comes so I can try <laughs> these things. Or you know, So you try mm -hmm. to think of some ways out. Mm -hmm. And having thought of some ways out, or having in the past tried some other things in maybe not the same situations, but right. in parallel situations, starts to give you some confidence that Oh, these tools that we carry mm -hmm. in our hands, they work. Mm -hmm. And so, so then, in any setting of fear or examples of that, like lifestyle change, mm -hmm. you can see other people who've modeled mm -hmm. it. You can know ways that hey, we took those steps. We we just had a bicycle those first years mm -hmm. of our married life. You know, maybe it will work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, I wonder. I wonder where you find those people. Um, I mean, I feel lucky to be able to know you and to see from your lived experience how you've done it, how you've let yourself be downwardly mobile, and how you've intentionally chosen that. But for other folks, like some of the students I work with, they've never seen that as an option, even. I think the way I'd respond to that is that we each have parents or grandparents mm -hmm. or friends or historical figures like you know, Dorothy Day or Martin Luther King Jr. or mm -hmm. Gandhi that have, have provided for us you know, models, ways of doing peace. So for me, that's important. Um, if I think of my own life, I, 
I'd probably go back to my parents. And then mom just didn't let me get away scot-free. They named me for this friend of theirs, Clifford Nakanagawa, who was in the U.S. concentration camps during the mm -hmm. Second World War. And they were working at a migrant camp when I was born, and so it was like, it was like laying their hands on me. Okay, mm -hmm. this is what you're supposed to be about. I, I didn't understand it at first. I mean, it was years later before it finally hit me. Huh. I have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, but dad and mom served as role models for me. But these other people that they introduced me to, I remember I learned to read with the Martin Luther King book about the bus boycott, Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And, and Dad was always working with migrant ministry in the church, and so there were people who came and showed us how to pick pickles in our little garden where we mm -hmm. made enough money to buy our bicycles. And, mm -hmm. and Dad was getting in trouble because he didn't want to pay taxes for war. So, mm -hmm. oh, you might not pay taxes for mm -hmm. war. Well, that's quite an idea. So I think of those kind of examples. Mm -hmm. What would you, where would you find your impetus your, yeah. your models. Yeah, I think meeting people who are doing the work currently like you or um, folks through school being exposed to different speakers who are coming right. and going different places and meeting different people through the Jan terms or through the study abroad. For me at least that was Jan incredibly helpful. Really Jan terms have been incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, I've gone on one where we went and visited various intentional communities and learned from people who are oh, choosing to live place. a simple yeah. lifestyle together. Yeah. That was really important. Or going to Haiti to learn about what work is being done for democracy and for human rights by Haitians. Um, and traveling to learn about the civil rights movement and about the immigrants rights movement currently as a civil rights issue. That's been incredibly important and meeting people along the way who are doing this work. It's, it's hard to say, oh, I can't do this work when I see people who are just doing it, who are living it. And I assume you could find people right close to home too, mm -hmm. or like students in school could find people close to their home communities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Might have to do some looking and mm -hmm. asking questions, but I, probably in every community there are those examples. Mm -hmm. Another question. If mm -hmm. you if you think of a, a peaceful society, uh, what are the ways that comes together? Do you think of it in terms of legal constructs or in terms of relationships, in terms of uh, building connections? How, do, how does it come together for you? Or does it, is there a bunch of those pieces all at once? In terms of how we make a peaceful society? Yeah, or in terms if you're... Of we're either right seeing now. one, what are the parts that make it function, or thinking about building one, what are the things that would be necessary for it to come together? Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think in particular, exposing yourself to communities you're not normally part of, um, like along class lines. That could be associating with the poor if you yourself are not poor, but it could be associating with the rich as well, or meeting people where they're at in like different racial groups or women or men or um, members of the GLBTQ community, putting yourself in situations where you're not necessarily comfortable with the intention to learn about another person's experience, I think is step one. I like that. I and like then that. step two is learning together. Like you've learned about somebody you don't already know about and you're letting their experience become your own and you're becoming neighbors in a true sense of the word. And then you think together, what do we need? What do our communities need? And how do we get it? So some of that is movement building, some of that is um, legal structures, but I don't think those come about without movement or without people pressure. Um, but, I really, but I think that element of becoming uncomfortable or like putting, putting yourself out there to learn, not to say I've got the answer, but learning and then together coming up with what do we really need now? Um, that might be better weight, like minimum wage issues, or that mm -hmm. might be um, making sure somebody's not persecuted in their own community or like can be fired at will for anything or um, 
maybe there's some other oppressive issue happening in your community that you can learn about and you can work together. And I think each of those struggles is a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think they all have to be there, whatever that issue is. Um, working on resolving it together feels really important. And once you've done it that once with that little issue in your community, your town or your church or whatever, um, it's easier to take on the whole system. I like that first step of discomfort, I think you were mm -hmm. almost saying, like to be with a group that you're different from. Mm -hmm. And it's like that tension provides the opportunity to move to a different level. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you and I were the, working on it, maybe we'd have visions similarly. Mm -hmm. And so we'd kind of stay down at this one level, but there wouldn't be anything that would force us to think at a different level Oh, well, mm -hmm. I never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Like, if the suicide bomber comes to your house, you say, right. whoa, I never thought about it that way before. Uh -huh. Or if you, like, if I'm always meeting with men and suddenly I start meeting with women's groups, mm -hmm. oh, that's a perspective I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. Wow, this could go somewhere. Right. And so to think about those differences, the ways we're confronted almost. It's a confrontation that drives us out of our comfort zones into a different, different way of thinking right. or acting. And sometimes those answers to the sticky problem become abundantly clear when you expose yourself to new people. Yeah. I was working for a summer in Louisville with a group that was trying to educate young people about poverty in this particular part of the city and there were some groups of folks who were trying to figure out, well, why aren't the poor people organizing? Like, there's this issue and it's really important. They weren't poor people. Well, so the group who was organizing was like, you know, middle class, white, uh -huh. predominantly folks yeah. who were saying, oh, we need to revitalize this neighborhood. Look, there's drugs. Look, there's violence. What can we do? Why aren't the people in this community organizing themselves? Um, and, it, and myself and the group that I was with living in that community, it's pretty abundantly clear that they don't, like the neighbors and ourselves in some ways, didn't have time because they're uh -huh. working three, two, three minimum wage jobs to try and pay the bills. So when this group came to us and was like, why aren't these poor people doing anything? It's like, well, <laughs> they're paying their bills. That's a pretty big something. And having that moment of clarity was like, oh, well now we can change the question. How do we make sure people get what they need so that they can organize themselves to get what they need? You know what I mean? Um, just yeah. changing that dynamic of the question only happens no. sometimes when you're exposed to a whole new viewpoint. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. a, yeah. yeah, it was really powerful. Yeah. So you, you were there in Louisville for a summer? For or? a summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. yeah it, was, it was really eye-opening. It was really important learning, and I think that's maybe where it first became clear to me the importance of being a part of groups you're not necessarily comfortable with initially because mm -hmm. pretty quickly it's not us and them, it's us, it's our yeah. community together. How do we fix these problems that are before us? Yeah. Okay, thinking of who you are, Becca, and the skills that you have and the dreams and experiences that you have, What's the, I won't, I won't lay it on you that you have to bring all the peace to the world, but what's the piece of peace building, what's the P-I-E-C-E of P-E-A-C-E mm -hmm. building that you hope to bring to our future? Hmm. Gosh, there's a lot of them, <laughs> isn't there? Okay, yeah. you, can, you can mention several. Well, I think... I think capacity building is really important so that it's not sort of the savior complex that the American population can easily fall into of, oh, we've got to go help those people. These people know how to help themselves. How do we support their work? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we as individuals become better at making that change in our own communities? So getting more people out there who know how to make a positive difference and who know how to walk alongside people who are making a positive difference. I think that's peace, so, i.e. Capacity building. Yes, okay, capacity building. Good. And then for myself, the issues I feel most connected to or feel the strongest draw to is these two, three pretty combined issues for me of 
classism, class disparity, gender-based violence, sexism, racism, and how those three or isms or these three structures that exist in our society keep us from doing the organizing we want, how these divisions are tearing groups who would be so clearly allies apart, yeah. and how if we make our own towns, our own communities a little bit more just, we can start taking on these big issues of militarism and uh, you know our foreign policy and when people have what they need, it's easier to get people motivated working towards the future they want to see instead of just tomorrow or tonight, you know? So that, that's sort of where I feel most called to now, although I know that absolutely could change as I learn more and continue to grow. So can I direct my granddaughters and my grandsons to you to be their trainer? I would love to. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah, and there's lots of other folks in each community that are good at that. So that yeah. sounds exciting. What are you most drawn to in terms of the piece mm. that you're really seeing is pressing for you now and for the future? Well, I've had s some amazing experiences mm. in the war zones of the world. I'm probably, as Arlene and I talk, we're clear that maybe one of the most important things that we bring to this whole effort is modeling at Joyfield Farm mm -hmm. what it means to live a lifestyle that doesn't require war to defend it. And mm -hmm. we're not there, mm -hmm. but we're grappling with those issues in what I hoped are important ways in our society. And so the opportunities to mentor, we've had interns there mm -hmm. at the farm wanting to learn how to grow food, but we talk about war tax resistance yeah. and lifestyle and that discipleship, and, and those are, oh, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed being there in those settings because we grow so much mm -hmm. from those opportunities. And then here in North Manchester, you know, we make our income from a market garden. And so what does it mean for a, a community to take back the economic decisions mm -hmm that impact our lives so Absolutely. we're not depending dependent upon decisions that are made in some boardroom hundreds or thousands of miles away but in fact those decisions are falling into our own community where local people are making those decisions and so how do you localize an economy rather than globalize an economy? Absolutely, yeah. So related to that, what's the vision of the future you would like to see lived out? Well, a vision, my vision is a world where we don't have a budget for war. There's mm -hmm. Sorry, there's nothing left over for war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't have to buy fighter jets or nuclear weapons or train soldiers how to mm -hmm. kill each other. We can use it to build highways, schools, hospitals, mm -hmm. houses, gardens. Mm. And it's a world where everybody has enough to eat and mm -hmm. knows how to grow their own food, where people spend time with each other, dreaming about the future to make mm -hmm. it better, how to work with places where there are struggles in our world. Um, I think that's what. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I would completely share that.